And so, um, you know, it's funny because the first question that she asked me, it was, and the first question she asked me was, she's like, so you're a nurse and, you know, how did you become, like, how did you get information or how did you know about, about money or finance? And I said, cause I was broke. That's easy. I don't know how many people will get on national TV and say that they were broke because nobody really wants to work. Like I, I have to be clear about that. And, you know, nobody really wants to work. Nobody really wants to own a business. What you want is the time and freedom to allow you to be able to, to enjoy the things that you enjoy. And so having, being an entrepreneur allows you to do that. Welcome to Nurses with Voices. I'm Dr. Lendra, your host and fellow nurse who's traded in burnout for breakthroughs. I'm here to show you how to transform your nursing career into one filled with purpose, reduce stress, and incredible opportunities. Whether you're looking to start your own business, build generational wealth, or simply find a healthier role in nursing, this podcast is for you. Join me to explore practical strategies to overcome burnout, combat bias, and chart new paths in nursing. It's time to reclaim your voice and reimagine your future in healthcare. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of Nurses with Voices. I'm your host, Dr. Lindra. Today, I have Veronica, better known as VVMP. She's not just a nurse practitioner. She's a dynamic nurse entrepreneur who has made waves helping nurses break the mold and achieve six to seven figures and success with their businesses. She is a sought after IV hydration startup expert and just has empowered countless healthcare professionals to really take control of their careers and their financial futures. I'm going to let her introduce herself. Share with us your, your journey as a nurse to being a nurse practitioner to a successful entrepreneur. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, and I, I am Veronica. Um, I do go by Viva MP. I have been in the nursing field for 26 plus years. Um, I always like to start off by saying I am Grayson's mom. I have a sophomore in college. I have, you know, she's my heart. She is why I do what I do. Um, just to make sure that she is well taken care of, well rounded, and that I can leave a legacy for her. So I always like to start off with that. Um, my journey started as a registered nurse, right? Um, I actually was a second degree um, nursing student. So I was um, an adult returning for that second degree, ended up being the president of my class. I actually went to an associate's degree program um, and everybody in there was younger than me. And so I felt a little out of place, but I was like, hey, we're going to do this, right? Um, I love helping people. And so that was my reason for wanting to go into nursing. I felt like, you know, back then it was, you know, you're always going to be able to find a job. Like you're always going to be able to take care of yourself. So I was like, okay, cool. I was married at the time. Um, I graduated, went into ICU immediately, uh, worked there. Most people, you know, were saying back then you need to go get two years of med search experience. That was not true. However, I did cry every day for the first six months that I was a new nurse, a new grad in the ICU. So um, it, it worked out for me, I'll say that. Um, I started uh, going to different departments, getting other experiences, getting different certifications because I wanted to make sure that I found my niche, right? I found the area of nursing that I just absolutely loved um, and there wasn't one for me. I ended up in the ER and saw that um, there was this continuous cycle of patients that were what we call frequent flyers. I'm sure they still use that term in the ER. And uh, I understood then that that was driving healthcare costs up, um, i.e. my tax dollars were paying for these people who were coming in all the time. And so I wanted to make sure that I did my part. So I started kind of doing a lot of education in the ER, trying to find out you know, why these people were coming in using the emergency room as a primary care, what was the missing link, the missing link um, that I kind of found out then was the fact that they didn't have care at home, which prompted me to open my first business as a registered nurse, and it was a home care agency. So I opened up a home care agency while I was um, an emergency room nurse. And within the first 18 months, I'd made my first million. Um, there was no social media then. It was all word of mouth. It was physicians that I had worked with that had gave, given me, you know, outstanding referrals. And it was me, you know, boots on the ground, doing work in the community, passing out flyers, going to Walmart, putting 
you know, home care flyers on people's cars, going to nursing homes, talking to discharge planners. So I really uh, started my business with with no budget. I didn't have any money, right? I hadn't been out of school that long. Um, I was married, in debt, bad credit. So the worst of the worst, it was where I started. So I started way behind the eight ball. And so if I, I tell people, if I can make seven figures in 18 months as a registered nurse with the first business and had no idea what I was doing, you know, 25 years ago, the sky's the limit today. So that's my intro. That's how I got started in a nursing entrepreneurship. So inspiring. It really, really, really is. I think more nurses need to hear your story. And and that actually, you actually answered like two questions for me, um, but it leads me to the question of, uh, well, really the statement that m- many nurses, they struggle, right, with the fear of stepping away from the bedside to pers- pursue that entrepreneurship. And you didn't. Like you saw a need and you went for it to help the community. And I, I completely admire that. What advice do you have for nurses who are hesitant to really take that leap, um, especially for those who feel financially or emotionally tethered to their current current roles? Um, the first thing I would say is just, you know, you still have to do it, right? So even if you do it, scared, you still have to do it. I did not quit my full-time job. Um, I worked both. So... Um, I, you know, I tell people all the time, had I, had I known, you know, then what I know now, I would not have worked three jobs to try to get money together to do the business. Um, I would have been a little more smarter about it. Um, but I, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know at the time. I just knew that I wanted to help people and I wanted to make money and that I didn't want to retire as an ER nurse, um, you know, 40 years from 20 years ago. And so I just ultimately um, just took, you know, one step at a time, asked questions, even though I wasn't getting a lot of information from people, because you had to remember, like 20 plus years ago, a nurse going out on her own to make a business was, was, was unthought of, right? And, and the amount of people, especially in the hospital system, where I work specifically, I can't speak to others, um, were very, where they were naysayers, right? You can't do that. So what are you doing? You're only a nurse. You're just, like, all of those things, right? What do you, you know, what makes you think it's going to be successful, all of that. And so you just have to block out the noise, you know, kind of know who you are. And I tell people that, you know, we're in this self-awareness stage now. We didn't have that then, right? And people are like, oh, you know, you kind of just do it. And I just did it. I just didn't listen to people. I, that's my personality anyway, right? Um, and so I just, again, one foot step in front of the other. Like, I just kind of was like, all right, I want a better life for myself. I enjoy this type of, you know, challenge. Let me see what happens. If I fail, I, at least I tried. And that was always my, you know, kind of my go-to. I'm like, well, at least I tried it. Because if I don't, I'm always going to be wondering if I could have done it, you know, what would have happened had I, you know, taken this leap of faith. So it was, it was definitely that. It was stick to it It was my faith in God. It was you know, me looking at my husband at the time, like, Lord, we can't keep, I don't want to live like this, right? I don't want to, we're two shifts passing in the night. You know, I'm working 12 hour shifts that turn into 12 or 14 hour shifts. And it's surprisingly enough, it, it worked out, even though there were challenges, don't get me wrong. Like I, I made some horrific mistakes because I just didn't know. Um, and, but I would say that there were more wins than losses. Um, and I just kind of kept going. And the more that I, kept going, the more momentum, the more encouraged I felt, the more people were like, oh my gosh, she's like really doing this. And then the doctors were like, you know, you're a great, you know, nurse. So translate those skills. And so I started translating those critical thinking skills, right? Those time management skills, the ability to take a nursing plan and actually apply it to a business. Because just because, you know, we're in the hospital, it doesn't mean that the nursing plan should stop. We still have to, we had to plan for what that transition home looked like. How do we keep these patients at home longer? How do we make sure that we include, you know, all of the healthcare professionals in their plans so that they really can stay at home and recover better? Um, and, you know, it saved money, right? It saved money for the hospital, saved money for our healthcare system, for the patient. So I felt like I was adding value to my community by doing my little piece. And so my little piece just happened to end up being a seven-figure business. Um, and so I was like, okay, <laughs> we can do this. Where, so where are you now with your home care business? Do you still have the home care business? Have you? Um, 
No. So I owned it for 16 years. And so I took that one location, uh, grew it to six locations. We were in North and South Carolina. Um, I went from servicing, you know, Medicaid patients to private patients to uh, we had contracts with the supplemental third party insurance companies. I had contracts with the government. I had contracts with the county. So we were I, by the time I sold my last one in 2018, we were doing about $6 million a year. I see why you're like the go-to choice for business entrepreneurship. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you you said something that really hit home, something that one of um, my mentors that like, we talk about, and it's, it's like you said, no one really talked about or told nurses about going into business. So up until, it's, it almost seems like a few years ago. Right. And so unless you grew up talking about certain things at the dinner table, no one really talked to us about business, right? Or investments. And, you know, it was it was you go to work, you work for your 20 or 30 years, you get your pension and you retire. And in recent years, you have industries like maybe hydration for one, that a lot of nurses have taken their power back and they've started their own IV hydration businesses. It's becoming very increasingly popular, um, IV hydration, med spas and such. And you've become one of the go-to experts for that in the field. So what do you believe sets successful IV hydration businesses apart from those that struggle? And what is the most common pitfall that you see new entrepreneurs make and what they should do? Ooh, this is the question I get all the time. Okay. Um, so I will say that I accidentally fell into IV hydration. People think that it was a like a decision that I made. It was not. Um, I, you know, had gone back to school and had become a nurse practitioner so that I could better serve those home care patients. That's initially why I went to grad school. Um, as a registered nurse, there were a lot of things and services that I was doing just because my skill set at the time was a lot more advanced than than your typical RN. Um, I ended up talking to my first million mentor back then and who had nothing to do with healthcare, but owned a gazillion home care agencies and literally was probably making $35 million a year. Um, and so I remember talking to him and he said, go back to school. You need to go back to school so that you can start billing for the services that you're giving. It's like, okay, cool. So I did. And so I became a nurse practitioner. I ended up uh, opening my own practice and I had four in the city that I live in and got referred one day to, um, I used to do DPC model, right? Direct patient care for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, basically it's, it's health calls. And so, and I used to drive a Maserati. And so I would go and they would like, oh, here's the Maserati medicine lady. And so that's what they called me. And I went to this particular home who happened to be a very affluent person who was related to, you know, a football player and she was dehydrated. And so I was like, oh, you need a drip, you know, let me give you one. And so she felt amazing after that. So she goes and she tells all of her rich friends, well, the rich friends aren't sick, right? And so you can't bill for that. You can't, it's a wellness visit. You can't bill for that. So you know, I started having all these inquiries of people who wanted to get hydration because they were they were about to travel or they just needed, you know, they wanted other things other than it being an acute um, occurrence for something. You can't bill for that, right, the way that the business was set up. So I had to set up another business structure to be able to charge them retail cash price for that, right, because you can't bill insurance for it. And so that's how it started. And honestly, it was, I didn't, I did not have any intention for, of starting an IV hydration business. However, it became, my phone was ringing off the hook. Um, and again, it was referral, right? I, at this point, probably had been in my city practicing for 12, 13 years. People knew me. They knew that the caliber of care that I, I delivered and my team, and they wanted what they wanted. And I was like, wow, it's a whole, like, there's a need for this. And I don't have to bill insurance and I can bill insurance and get all of my money and not just 85% of it because I'm doing the services. Um, and so, yeah, so we created another, you know, entity just for IV hydration. Um, and I ended up setting up in, in uh, pharmacies. And let me tell you, it's, it was like the minute clinic of IV hydration drips. It was crazy. 
And so I got kicked out of one of the pharmacies because those patients would come in and overtake the waiting room at the pharmacy. So there wouldn't be any room for the pharmacy's patients to come in and wait and get their medications because everybody was waiting for a drip. And so I, I had to leave that space. I had to, they were like, yeah, you can't, you got too many people in here. So I was like, okay. So then I opened up, um, an IV hydration, um, practice where I solely just did that, but it, it became more than that, right? It became a, a, an aspect of functional medicine for me. Um, and so then I really delved into it, went through a divorce, had my own things going on and, um, IV hydration for me became a lifesaver. I started to use a lot, utilizing it, got really into micronutrient therapy, you know, how it can make my body function better. Um, I was going through uh, depression and anxiety. I was, um, and I tell people this all the time, I was taking some anti-anxiety um, medications, but I didn't like the way it made me feel. And so as I started to really learn about micronutrient therapy and how your body is supposed to work with it, right, when it's optimizing health when you're working and you're everything's like doing what it's supposed to do um i started i became my own patient and and then i realized i was like wow this isn't it is a money maker but it's more than that um and it really saved my life and i you know was having trouble sleeping and so i would take a shot of gin every night to go to sleep and i'm like girl you can't keep doing this alcoholism runs in my family and i was i'm very i was very aware of that I was like, you can't keep, like, you've got to figure out what's going on. So literally I started um, take, doing NAD. I really started uh, looking at um, the properties of some of the micronutrients that I was taking. Um, I looked at, um, you know, exome therapy. And so that's how literally I really started getting into it. And it opened up a whole new world when I started talking to practitioners about it. Um, the passion wasn't just from a business aspect. It was from this literally saved my life. And I will tell you when my perspective and my mindset around it changed, the business blew up complete, like even more. I went for, it was, it was ridiculous. And so in a good way, in a good way. And so, uh, yeah, I ended up on television talking about it. I ended up like, it was just, and so I just think I, I aligned with what the purpose was for me at that moment in my life. Uh, women who were healthcare providers that were overworked, right, underappreciated, we were stressed, I was trying to be mom, I was, you know, again, trying to, to do all the things and be good at all the things that I really felt like I had come to the end of myself. And so IV hydration for me was a lifesaver. Um, and so, yeah, and so I just started incorporating my story into uh, the business. And so then people wanted to be to start teaching. And so I talked to a couple of plastic surgeons you know, went in, trained their staff. Again, a lot of it was built on our reputation here. And so uh, they started making six figures easy. And and I wasn't charging them. Let's just be clear. I was not, I was just going in and, and being nice. And then I realized, girl, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Um, because it, like it would, I would get a call at least once a week you know, from a physician that wanted me to come in and like train their staff. And I'm just like, I can't keep doing this for free because it's very, it's, it's labor intensive work. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, talked to my attorney who said, okay, we're going to start teaching. You're going to start teaching I'm like, okay. And charging people. So, yeah. So I said, who else better than my colleagues? Who else better than other RNs who want to, uh, you know, take control of their financial future. And even if they don't want to leave their job full-time, have a, you know, a side or part-time job where they literally can begin to change the trajectory of their financial future um, and take their time back. Because nobody really wants to work. Like, I, I have to be clear about that. And, you know, nobody really wants to work. Nobody really wants to own a business. What you want is the time and freedom to allow you to be able to, to enjoy the things that you enjoy. And so having, being an entrepreneur allows you to do that. Um, and so, yeah, so I started teaching and uh, I think 2017, I started teaching these courses and it was an overwhelming response from our, our nursing colleagues that were like, yeah, like teach me what you know. And so I did, I started teaching uh, locally, took it on the road, went across the country, 
my classes went from 20 people to, I think we've had 106 people at one point in a class um, and literally just giving them the basics. And it wasn't anything short of the information that I had gathered through the, I think at that point I had been doing it for five or six years, had hired a clinical optimization team, had gone through you know, all the things where I could help people and troubleshoot because anything that could go wrong, I already did it. Or we've already worked it out. I already talked to legal. I already know what the boards of pharmacies are. You know, like all of those things had been done over the course of five or six years. And so I just basically gave, you know, nurses the information that I had and then gave them the resources. So I hate going to, to conferences and people tell you how they did something, but don't tell you how to do it. And so I wanted the how to do it, and here is who you call. So that way you don't have to Google it, because Google is wrong. We know, right? Everybody gets on Google, and they think that IG University, because we didn't have that back in the day, right? I didn't have that. So um, people think that, you know, Wikipedia is the end all be all. And I'm like, no, you can start a Wikipedia page today if you wanted to. Like, make up a word and give it a meaning, and boom, you're on there. So I wanted to make sure that we had valid information. I wanted to make sure that legally... We, you know, this is how you structure your business because you don't learn that in nursing school. A lot of my first clients were physicians. They didn't learn how to run a business in medical school. And so we had to lay the foundation. We had to make sure, you know, I'm glad y'all can read vital signs, baby, but you got to be able to read a balance sheet as well. Like you got to, you got to understand what a P&L statement is, right? And so those basic things, um, what we realized is that a lot of nurses and healthcare providers don't have that basic foundational information. They get excited and they think, oh, I've got to, you know, website, I got a logo, I got a business. No, ma'am, no, sir. That is not, that is, that is the least of your concerns. <laughs> this is the least of your concerns. Let's get excited about it. Um, and so, yeah, so we, I started teaching and my attorney traveled everywhere with me. We, we did, and I cannot, you know, shout out to Wagner Hicks. Sean Wagner has been the best attorney a girl could ask for because we built this thing from the ground up. And he literally went to every class, did every presentation on legal basics for healthcare practitioners, because we have to protect our license first and foremost. And so that's where we started. And, and here we are in 2024, having taught over 7,500, you know, nurses, nurse practitioners and physicians, the business of IP hydration, and not only that, but how to start your clinics, right? How to uh, make sure that you're doing things the right way. So here we are. And it's been a, quite a wild ride, I will say. But yeah. And so what I'm hearing a lot of the pitfalls is in one of them in particular, which I always talk about is that business savviness and knowing about how the business side of having your practice. And I, I'm actually glad that you mentioned that because that is something that we're not taught in healthcare. And speaking of nurses in particular, um, like you said, physicians as well, we're, we're taught customer service. We're taught how to care for patients and no one really teaches us the business side of healthcare. And if you, and I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point because that's just what, that's just what it is. Right. And to really start to think about getting out into entrepreneurship, you really need to know the basics. And so it's very powerful. And I don't know if people really understand that if you don't know the basics of, like you said, how to balance a budget, that's going to be one of your biggest pitfalls in having and starting your business. And that's going to be a huge failure on their part. You know, owning a six and seven figure business, it's a, it's a huge achievement. And what what would you say were some of the biggest challenges that you faced on your journey um, and how did you overcome it, particularly balancing the professional responsibilities with the personal will? There isn't a balance. <laughs> there, is, there is no a balance. Um, um, people always talking about finding a work-life balance. You, you, it, it's not to be found. You have to create it. Um, you have to set boundaries, right? Uh, learning how to say no is definitely a thing. Um, and even saying no to yourself, because a lot of us as healthcare providers are givers and we are overachievers. And so we literally have to say no to ourselves because you have to preserve self, right? Um, but what I will say is that one of the, there are five pillars, right? Because at this point in my journey, um, I do a lot of business coaching. And so I tell people there are five main pillars. The first one is going to be money. 
Um, when people think about starting a job or, you know, they want to know how much the salary is, you start to think about starting a business, they want to know how much it's going to cost me, right? And so the main thing about money is figuring out how much you need, where you're going to get it, you know, and how do you keep as much of it as possible? So how do you raise capital, right? Do I work myself to death, save my money? Do I go get a loan? Do I, you know, where does the money come from to do this? Unless you're a trust fund baby or someone is like, you know, an angel investor who is going to just give you some money. And I tell people, you know, you go out and get a loan. These people want their money back, right? So loans are great. Business credit is wonderful, but you still have to show a viable business because they want their money back. You know, if it's a grant, that's that's great. But honestly, a lot of people don't have the the mental bandwidth to sit and apply for grants on a regular basis until they get the amount that they're going to need to be able to start a business, depending on what it is, right? And startup for med spas can be anywhere from ten thousand to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Same thing with IV hydration or your clinic, right? It depends. Like I've got clients who opened up urgent cares and they thought they were going to be able to do it with a fifty thousand dollar budget. Absolutely not. Like you're it's an urgent care. No, like, so we have to be realistic when it comes to money and understanding how money works, the cycle of money, what it looks like in your community, um, and even how it cycles through your quote unquote hospital system. And I, t- I'm, I always refer to hospitals because most nurses are coming out of the hospital. And so, you know, we understand the patient care side of the hospital, but not the business side of the hospital. The hospital is in business to make money, period. Everything else is ancillary. (laughs) So, you know, um, and a lot of times, you know, I always get this example as a registered nurse, how many days you go home with saline in your pocket, tape in your pocket, alcohol preps in your pocket, extra needles in your pocket. You pull that drawer out in your house, wherever it is, probably in your kitchen. You put all of that stuff in the drawer and you close it and you go back to work and you do that same thing three or four or five or six more times a week. Then you wonder why you don't get a raise. Your raise is in that kitchen drawer. All those supplies that you're hoarding, that stuff costs money. That's the business of the hospital. But then we want to complain about, oh, we need a raise. Well, honey, I need you to take all those supplies back because <laughs> they cost money. <laughs> Alcohol preps are 17 cents per unit. Excuse me, right? So you have to understand those little saline bottles, even though they get a discount because they're a hospital system, they still cost money. They're probably about seven cents per bottle. So you have to, I mean, again, and I'm a numbers girl, as you can tell, right? So you have to understand that things cost money and not be so naive to the fact that, you know, that money doesn't grow on trees. As we all heard that when we grew up. But when you're in business, especially as a small business, as a startup, you have to be very aware of the cost of everything. So money always. The second thing is going to be mindset, because if you don't think you can, you can't. Period. Like there's no, if you don't think you can, you can't. Right. So you have to make sure that mindset and mindset isn't a one and done. You don't fix it and you go to the next thing. It is a constant conversation, is a constant movement, is a constant how can I be better conversation? I literally last night sat here and was like, all right, girl, you've done this thing. Now you have to do this thing. So how are we going to move your mind consciousness to that thing, right? Everybody wants to talk about manifestation. That's cool. That's great. But you got to do the work to get there, right? What does that look like? So so really digging deep in why you're doing stuff, right? Dealing with the personal things in your life that you don't want to talk about, that you suppressed for years, that are going to come back up throughout your business journey. There is no way around them. The things that you don't deal with in your personal life will show up in your business. If you have a bad attitude with your husband, cousin, sister, brother, it's going to show up at some point when a client, patient, or customer gets on your nerves. You're going to revert back to those same types of behaviors that um, may not uh, bring you the monetary justification that you like. So you got to deal with that stuff, right? You got to learn how to talk to people. Um, And you have to learn how to talk to yourself. I talk to myself all the time. I remind myself of who I am, why I'm here, what I'm doing, right, where I'd like to go. So mindset is really, really important. And then you have to understand in the mindset that the money that you're making is energy. There are ebbs and flows of money. There are ebbs and flows in business. It's not always up. It's not always up. And you have to be prepared for the down times. So money, mindset. The next thing is messaging. I tell people to, to think about right? What's your message? Who are you marketing to? What are you telling them? What are you trying to sell them? 
Am I talking to the Eskimo that I'm trying to sell ice to? It's like, you have to understand the message. What is it? You know, what, why do I come to, you know, Lindra, right? Why am I coming to her? What is it that she's going to help me solve? What problem is she helping me solve? So you have to have a great message and it has to make sense to the people that you want to give you money for whatever that thing is, right? So messaging is really, really important. The next thing is methodology. People go, what's the methodology? It's a system. It's a systematic approach to making money, a systematic approach to, you know, what are you doing in your business? What does your email marketing system look like? How are you communicating with people? What does your HR system look like? And as small businesses, we think, oh, I'm just a solo practitioner. I'm just a lonesome nurse. I'm by myself. I don't need an HR. Yes, you do. You still have to have an application, a resume. You still need to do a background check. We still need to make sure that your license is intact and un unencumbered. You still have to do your skills checklist or whatever those things are for the type of business that you run. You have to have systems for all of these things. Otherwise, you're going to drive yourself crazy. And then you're going to be unorganized and you're not going to make any money. The more organized you are, the more easy it is for the money to slide into your bank account. So I tell people all the time, the last thing that you have to make sure that you have is momentum. I talked about it. You've got to take action. If you're not doing anything, right, nobody's knocking on your door. I'm single now. My mom says, UPS is not, uh, FedEx is not delivering men to your door, honey. You got to go outside. Like you got to go do something. Go be somewhere. Go be seen. You have to have momentum. So, you know, once you decide whatever it is you want to do, then you have to make sure that you're putting yourself in those uh, particular environments where you can be seen, where you can be found, right? Everybody's not your ideal client, nor should you want them to be, right? You should want the people who want you. So once you decide what that looks like for you, marketing, because nobody wants to talk about anything except for marketing, marketing then becomes easy because I am who you want, you are who I want. It's a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. And so now let me figure out how I can help you get to whatever your end result is. So those pillars, right, those may, and those all start with M's, right? I tell people, if you can just, if you can make sure that those pillars for you make sense, figuring out the high to, how to is easy. You're going to have to have someone to help you, right? Because when you do it by yourself, it takes a long, long time. When you have a mentor or a coach, right, they will collapse time for you. It's taken me 25 years to get here. But if you work with me, it shouldn't take you 25 months because I already told you what not to do. I'm telling you now what to do, and I'm giving you the resources to do it. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, we have that we know everything and you can't tell us anything mentality that is totally wrong and that will cause you to be broke if you decide to not listen. So, you know, those are the things that I can tell people up front, like, you know, and, and, and I charge to it. I, look, I charge a lot of money at this point. Back in the day, I did stuff for free. And now I'm like, wait, <laughs> okay, hold on. what, because what, what people don't understand, this is changing your, not just your life, but this is changing the life of the people that are in your bloodline. Like if you do this right, you're, you're building wealth for generations after you. You know, I, I, I said it in jest earlier, but it's, easy to create trust funds for your family. It's easy. You just have to know how to do it. And you don't have to have a lot of money. People think, oh my God, you have to have millions. No, you don't. You can start with $500 if you want to and create that trust and then just continue to build on it so that, you know, a hundred years from now, they can talk about you having set up the trust for your family. And it literally can change the way that your, your family operates, moves, grows, it's amazing what entrepreneurship can do. Like, you know, you want to be a nurse and, and, and that's great, but what legacy are we leaving? What impact are we leaving when we're no longer here? So that's how I live my life now. Like, I'm, I'm going to be 50 in a couple of weeks. And so if someone had told me at 22, this is what it would be like, I'd be like, who, what, who, who's doing that? But I appreciate the journey, you know, all of the wins, all the losses, the, the relationships um, that I've developed uh, in business throughout the years. And you can find nursing in every industry. That's the other thing, every industry. I consult with every industry. It's ridiculous. I'm like, oh, wow. Like, oh, no. Because the critical thinking skills that we have are unmatched. It's transferable.
Absolutely. Once you know that, that you are the sauce and that people need what you have, it, it gives you this confidence. Like <laughs> I walk in a board rose, I'm like, okay, what you need? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> If yeah. like, I can help you, right? And I, right. And if I don't, if I don't know what they're talking about, it doesn't matter. It right. doesn't even matter because I'm like, you need the expertise that I have. Right, right. And and nurses are natural born entrepreneurs, and we have to recognize that and use that because you know our skills are transferable, and we don't realize that's why we do so well in business. That's one of the reasons why. Because we're, we're like natural, we're natural at it. And I love how you talk about money. It's interesting. I'm glad that you bring that up because I saw something, um, I think it was on LinkedIn. And I saw that you had, you had a, you were a guest on the, uh, the morning, the morning show yesterday talking about money. Oh, yeah. You, so I, oh, yeah. yeah. I, so, <laughs> uh, they wanted a, a money expert. And so, uh, here we are. Right. And so again, <laughs> every industry, every industry needs a nurse. And so, um, you know, it's funny because the first question that she asked me, it was good morning, uh, good day, Texas, excuse me. Okay. Um, ABC network in, uh, in Dallas. And the first question she asked me was, she's like, so you're a nurse and, uh, you know, how did you become like, how did you get information or how did you know about, about money or finance? And I said, cause I was broke. That's easy. I don't know how many people will get on national TV and say that they were broke, but I'm very transparent, right? I, I'm just like, what do you mean? Like that's, you go find money. When you need it, you go find it and you learn about it. I'm put to be like, lady, what? But, okay. Um, but yeah, so I talked about the seven, uh, seven steps or seven things that everyone should know about money, but, but nobody really does. And so, you know, I talked about money being energy, right? And so I talked about how you have to uh, we think that buying in bulk saves us money. It does it. It, it literally throws it away because it's either going to expire or you don't really need all that you thought you did. Um, and so we think we think quantity all the time instead of over quantity. I'm like, no, no we don't do that. I, and then we talked about how people tend to put all their eggs in one basket. No, you have to diversify, right? The banks don't even put their money in banks. Most people don't know that. And so when you really start learning about money, the cycle of money, you know, and um, how to compound it, you know, it works for you. And so, but people don't want to give their money an assignment and it's because they're afraid it's going to go away and they're not going to have enough of it. When you understand that the, the more money you want, it literally comes from you aligning yourself with it being able to come to you. I don't chase money. Money chases me. That means contracts come to me and I'm not I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. Right. This opportunity to be on the morning show. I'm like, oh, they call. I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah. We can talk about money. I can talk about money all day and the ebbs and flows of money. But if money is, if there's a downward flow or ebb, right? Of money. I don't freak out about it because I know that there's going to be an upswing. Right. And I position myself so that even when there is a ebb of money, I'm still making money. Right. So if the market crashed, people go, oh, my God, no, we we're making money even still, even in the down market, because that's the opportunity for you to buy things. Right. That are of value right. so that when there's an upswing, you can sell it for the gain, whatever that is. So but yeah, but people don't think, you know, you're a nurse. You're supposed to talk about, you know, the sick and shut in all the time. No. Right. People people get sick because they don't have enough money. Like, literally, yeah, they they stress out. And I'm like, no, like everything you need is literally within you already. Your job is just to enhance it, to magnify it, go get additional information so you can elevate the understanding of it. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I have really, truly enjoyed this conversation. What do you have coming up? Um, I'm really kind of taking it easy right now. I'm not doing the large classes anymore, very intimate courses. I am still, you know, doing the business strategy where I'm consulting with, you know, healthcare practitioners. I want more nurses to, to, to come see me um, about, you know, what is it that they really, really want? I have a, a mastermind a program that I call My Mindset, My Millions. And so that literally is a six-month program where we as, you know, nurses, we really talk about what it looks like to start a business, what type of business, you know, how do you get business credit? How do you make sure those foundational things are taken care of? So you can not only start, grow, but scale your business. 
Um, and so scaling to seven figures is not like, you know, you're crossing that six figure mark in your business and it's not, it's not hard to make money. People think it's like, you know, money's running away from them, but it's not hard. And so you just have to have, again, the systematic approach to how to do it. Um, and so I'm doing that. I took a bunch of nurses last year to Dubai um, to do some executive wellness um, business there. So um, we'll be planning an international trip again uh, in 2025. So I've got some things coming up that I'm excited about. And so, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'll be 50 in a couple of weeks and I'm open now to to all the things. So we'll see. We'll see. Happy birthday. And so how can people find you? So across all social media platforms, it's Be The MP. Um, on LinkedIn, it's actually Veronica Smith Sutherland. But Or you can go to my website, be the MP.com. There you go. Well, there you have it, everyone. We had the VMP on today, just given such an inspirational journey and such an impactful message. So I thank you so much. So everyone, until next time, make sure you stay educated, stay inspired, stay inspired and stay empowered. And I will see you in the next episode.